I think we're on and we're good to go. They're saying you guys are a little bit low, but there's not a lot I can do about that. Um, let me tell you what. Let's let's get started, and if the, if it's a little bit low, then I'll restart the stream, but we'll stay on, okay? So, all right. So, um, thank you, North, for having us up on OWN. Welcome, OPN, and all our friends and viewers and chatters. Uh, and hopefully we have some listeners of Occupy Air turning in to get the, uh, the video feed tonight. So we're very fortunate and happy to have the, Occupy, the Air Occupy crew here, less one. Um, so, but uh, Liz is going to speak for Jerry. So I want to welcome Liz, who you see on the top left, and Shannon, who you see on the top right and then there's little old me in the bottom middle and uh, you want to introduce your girls while we're at it Shannon? Sure. Uh, this is my older daughter Marin who is nine and my younger daughter Connor who is seven. Well thanks for bringing them along tonight that's great it's a family affair and I'm glad you're getting them introduced into uh, new media. So um, <laughs> Welcome, you guys, and we apologize for the delay getting getting set up. You know, it's just like juggling juggling cotton balls, but we, we got it, and we look good, so I look for the chat to keep me posted on the quality. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourselves and give a brief bio? I'll go. Okay. Um, I'm Liz, uh, Liz Myers, and um, I... Uh, and part of one third of Air Occupy right now. Um, come from North Carolina, actually very close to Asheville. Hickory, North Carolina is where I grew up. Uh, went to college in Virginia and then uh, went to law school in California. So um, I am actually an attorney that's barred in California, has my license in California, not barred. <laughs> I, I didn't take the bar exam, but I'm not barred. Um, not practicing currently, but uh, trying to do more Occupy stuff. Um, very excited to, to be on Air Occupy. We're, um, I think we're doing some good stuff and putting out some good information. Um, and I'm also involved in um, Occupy Media Network. So if anybody who's listening wants to be a part of Occupy Media Network or has a, you know, um, question about any of the other Occupy shows that are out there, um, ask it because. I can get you the info, and I also have info on the National Gathering, the Occupy National Gathering that's going to be in Kalamazoo in August. Kalamazoo, okay. Michigan. And Kalamazoo. Uh, yeah, so why don't you inter introduce the other third that couldn't be with us tonight, just so we want everybody to understand that uh, Air Occupy is a, a team effort, and uh, yes. one, one third of the team is not able to be with us tonight. No, um, the other third is my husband, Jerry, and he is also an attorney. He was an attorney for about 20 years in Washington, D.C., um, and yeah, he's, uh, he's, I don't know what else to say about him. <laughs> well, that, well, that's good, because we'll, we'll get into details later. Okay. Shannon, how about an introdu introduction from you? We have, we have an escaped lizard over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Shannon McLeish, and uh, I am a self-employed freelance editor. Uh, I work mainly in higher education before the Air Occupy stuff, and, uh, I, you know, uh, I kind of have been thrust into this by virtue of parenthood as far as I can see. You know, it's really been my motivating. Great. Um, and you have two beautiful daughters there. They're very animated. So this is this is good because sometimes I get get pinged on you know lack of visual interest. So now we have it for sure tonight. Um, oh yeah. So you know this is just mostly a conversation. So chime in whenever you feel like, and I'll attempt not to. Uh, talk over you and um, this will all work out. It it may not be as good a technology as you guys are used to, but I don't um, know about that. <laughs> we'll do the best we can. So how long has Air Occupy been on air? 
almost a year. We started in April of last year. We've done 48 shows so far um, on lots of different topics. Uh, but yeah, since April of last year, we're we're coming up on the one year anniversary. Yeah, consecutive programming. We really haven't missed at all. Yep, and you're doing weekly shows, so that's I mean you've been at it strong, uh, and I. I can, you know, verify how difficult it is to stay consistent and and be on a on task. So you guys have been on an air uh, for a year, and your show days are usually on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and um, you can also, you can listen to us live in Daytona Beach, Ormond Beach, which is I should have told you where we were from. <laughs> um, but we are in Florida and um, just outside of Daytona Beach, and you can listen live um, on WELE Goliath Radio, um, 1380 AM, or you can listen on um, on uh, line at GoliathRadio.com. Um, so I I want you know this is the important thing. One of the important things I want to touch on tonight that I can't stress uh, enough is um, Air Occupy, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with them, is actually bridging the gap between uh, internet media and traditional, for lack of a better word, a mainstream media outlet because they simulcast on the Goliath Radio, which is an AM radio station in Ormond Beach, Daytona Beach area. So, you know, we talk about that a lot, about how to bridge those gaps, and that's one of the things that I find really appealing about what you guys are doing. Um, have any of you guys worked in media before Air Occupy, and what skill sets did you bring to the endeavor? Well, I mean, if you count uh, editing for academic journals, media, then um, I have. <laughs> we... Uh, when we started out, the the AM station that we're on, the owner of the station, um, actually as one of the radio hosts, was an occupier and introduced us to the, the owner of the station. So we were going on uh, as Occupy Daytona Beach on the radio like once a month before we came on. And I, for me, that was the extent of my radio experience. And you were going on as a guest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, giving updates. And what about you, Liz? Had you had any media experience previous? Not really, no. Um, I had written for the uh, UC Davis Law Journal, Law Review, um, but I don't know that that's actually media. <laughs> um, kind of editing again, you know, like a lot of editing experience. Right. Um, but no, no experience in media. And it's funny because I really enjoy it. Um, we, through the radio station, we applied for press passes. Um, so we actually got these really cool press passes that we later got laminated. And it says press, and it's signed by the Volusia County, which is the county that we're in, the Volusia County Sheriff. And so I'm, I'm waiting for a time where I get to flash my press pass and be like, <laughs> that hasn't happened yet, but, you know. Yep, that's awesome. Yeah. Actually, I have to go, you know, since Liz mentioned that, I don't know how I missed it, but my mother was, uh, uh, I, I do have some media experience because my mother was a reporter for a major newspaper for basically my entire life. Well, I'd say that would do it, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, if you guys hang on just a second, I'm doing some levels adjustments here because the crew is having trouble hearing you guys. Now, is this recorded? Yes, it is. It is recorded. It's live right now, and it is recorded for playback, and uh, we'll put it in our our archives. So, okay, let's see how that works. Is that a little bit better on the channel? If you guys want to let me know. Oh, we can talk. We'll just talk, checking the levels, checking the levels. Hi there. <laughs> How's it sounding? I think it's going to be fine. Um, is there a staff other than the three of you guys who produce Air Occupy shows? No. No. This is yes. so. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you pull a typical show together? Well, 
Shannon, you want to take it? <laughs> uh, really, I think you better take that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we decide on a guest. You know, we well we decide on a topic, and then we try to find a guest. Um, I, you know, we look at you know, professors or uh, activists who are doing stuff on the issue, um, or um, someone who's spoken out about about the issue that we want to talk about, and we contact them and you know set up a date. And we do all of our shows live, and they're commercial free. Um, we uh, got a small grant from the Movement Resource Group to uh, keep us commercial free, which was awesome. Um, so we are commercial free. But anyway, that's a, uh, I digress. Um, so our show, basically what our show is, we do a little intro and we have music usually related to the topic. And then we um, do about a 30 to 40 minute interview um, continuously so we don't you know, since we don't take any commercials, we do a little music, and then we come back with, um, I'm getting, we're going to get a cat, too. <laughs> 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 and we come back with a, uh, with a you know, a, a little summary, you know, with more information or where you can find more information. And we do a lot of different topics. I mean, um, First Amendment, uh, police militarization, uh, right to protest. We've done GMOs. Uh, we had Jeffrey Smith. Um, with GMOs, and then we had uh, Fukushima. We had uh, Beyond Beyond Nuclear. We had, and then um, um, Jake, uh, Jake Feldman with Beyond Pesticides, yeah. uh, talking about pesticides. Best way to rob a uh, bank is to own one. Bill Black, Professor Bill Black. That was a good show. That, that was a good show. Uh, and Occupy the SEC with uh, uh, Alexis Goldstein. And Elizabeth Friedrich. And Elizabeth Friedrich, yeah. That was a bang up show. That was a fun one. Yeah. Uh, on permaculture, we got a friend of ours, Jenny Nazak, who's uh, into permaculture, and those were interesting. Um, gosh. We've had, we've had 48 consecutive shows. Yeah. Right. Well. We do call in shows, which are always fun, you know. Um, kind of get to hear from different people and what's going on and um, we give updates on uh, what Occupy is doing around um, the United States because I think uh, a lot of people think that Occupy is dead, <laughs> but people who are doing it know that that's not true. Um, we were doing um, you know, all sorts of cool stuff, we as an Occupy people all, all across the United States. Right. I find that to be true too and you know there's always a conversation about well occupies in a lull and they're waiting for spring and it's it's hella busy I mean there's something happening everywhere like in DC this morning the Keystone XL lockdown at TD Bank and stuff yeah. there's something happening every day so you know it's just being aware of it and I think people and this is one of the questions I had for you guys later on about how media how we're managing media you know, for the movement, but I think people equate, you know, what is is going on with what's on a live stream, and you know, there's a lot, there's always a lot going on. You know, we just may see it, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, I had the my next question was what came first, Air Occupy on the radio or the internet, but I want to want to back up a little bit because you guys were some of the founding members of Occupy Daytona Beach, right? Right. Yeah. And so from that, if I understood your comment earlier, one of the hosts of the local radio station was an occupier, and that was your entry point. So let's talk about um, how you move from. Um, well, let's talk about how you move from starting up Occupy Daytona. Daytona Beach into the broadcasting and radio arena. That would be a great story. I'd love to hear it. I think I can take that one, or at least begin it. Um, we were meeting, Occupy Daytona Beach started up pretty quick um, after they took Zuccotti Park. We had a planning meeting for our first event on I think it was like October 10th, maybe, and then we had our first event like maybe the 15th, 
very fast after that. Um, and we had a lot of people there. Uh, the way we planned the event was we uh, invited uh, union members and the NAACP. Uh, there were a couple of other civic groups, some environmental groups, and we kind of invited everybody. And then we had some speakers from each. Then we opened it up for teachings, not that we knew what that was at the time. Um, and so it was a pretty pretty varied group. A lot of teachers, postal workers, uh, the police actually expressed a lot of support on the sidelines. Um, that's that's uh, that the guy who uh, first brought us to to meet the owner of the station, Jim, was at that first event. Liz and Jerry were um, what we did as we progressed, and we were holding GAs and talking with each other. Uh, we were holding a lot of events. We had marches and. Uh, we, we were meeting weekly, at least once, maybe twice a week for GAs. And what we talked about uh, heavily had to do, media was a big one. You know, the lack of mainstream media coverage, the slanted mainstream media coverage, uh, the, the lack of information on what the real issues were, on what was really going on with banks and corporations and power and democracy. Um, the other big topic, there were like two other big topics, and the other, the other two main t topics were the foreclosure crisis um, and the fraudulent foreclosures because our area is really hard hit, mm -hmm. and the environment. And what on this list? Um, Jobs. I, I remember the first. Our first rally was on October fifteenth, uh, twenty eleven, and um, there there were a lot of so uh, signs about uh, jobs not cut, cut uh, jobs not cut. Um, and I know I, I spoke to a lot of people about income inequality and um, austerity, moving away from austerity in the United States. So um, I, I think that those were some of the main issues. We, we occupied a park, uh, uh, we called it, it's Tuscawilla Park in Daytona Beach, but we called it um, Zuccotti by the Sea. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, uh, we were in a park for a while. We actually petitioned the, um, the city council in Daytona Beach to, to be able to do that. And <clears throat> it, it was an interesting relationship between our da occupied Daytona Beach and the um, and the cops, because we we had some um, death threats against our group um, before the first rally. Uh, pe uh, people on the internet said that they wanted to uh, bring their gun down and and snipe at us. I think it was a sniper kind of comment. It was on the an AK-47 board. So, you know, when before we even went to the before Jerry and I went to the first rally, I, I looked it up and I, I found this like entry. I was like, ooh. <laughs> so we had a we had contact with the police because of that. Uh, they had contact with us because we were occupied. <laughs> um, uh, so we, we cooperated. Um, our group. I, I distinctly remember a GA when we were talking and and we decided that. Um, no one would get arrested in Daytona Beach um, because it wasn't quite worth it. Um, we, you know, we'd save our arrest for somewhere larger um, in a larger group and make a civil disobedience of it. Um, so Specifically, yeah. we said we would get arrested for the tar sands pipeline, mm -hmm. but not for six people standing with a sign in front of Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, you know, I, I respect that. That's that's actually a strategy I subscribe to. Mm -hmm. Although I would have to say we had 400 plus people at our first rally. Yeah, it was which big. Which was amazing, um, an amazing uh, turnout. And we continued to get about 30 people um, together. For a while, and then things just kind of, you know, kind of ran ran its course. People lost interest in time and energy, except for a group of hardcores. So, 
your activities there in the park you guys occupied led you to doing bits on the local on the local radio station um, as an informational service like a voice of the occupy right exactly and exactly. we were um, on the radio Shannon invited us uh, Jerry and I to be on the radio and um, Jerry <laughs> Jerry um, I guess the the host said uh, Wow, you guys are pretty good at this. You should have your own show. And we said, well, can we have our own show? <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah. So that's, that's kind of how that happened. Well, that was going to be my next question. Is like, how how did um, how did you guys end up getting your own show? And you just because you were good at it and you were good spokespeople, right? I don't know if we were necessarily so good at it, but. Um, I think we were entertaining enough <laughs> that Big John, the owner of the station, said, okay. And we would rile people up, I think. Actually, I think, you know, number one, it's Daytona Beach. So uh, there's a pretty, pretty strong um, a conservative contingent here. Uh, the, the conservative talk radio is very strong. Um, what's coming across, you know, about Occupy there is that, you know, we're the unwashed hippie thing and... Defecating on police cars. Someone yeah. actually called us up and said, why is everyone defecating on police cars at Occupy? And, of course, that was not what we were at all. And it right. was very plain, you know, and there were students and, you know, it was definitely a mixture, but... It, it was, and I really think that we were representative, just like Occupy uh, across the country, but there's a different dynamic in a smaller town where, you know, you're more connected to your local officials, it's easier to connect. Um, we approached it at first because it kind of worked out that we may as well just go ahead and do it that way because they were there. But as we continued, we approached it with a, of course you would want us to express our free speech and of course you're impacted by this too and so what do we do so that we can draw together as a community and, and uh, strengthen and say what we need to say as citizens. Right, so so a lot of just you know, routine normal engagement and outreach and you sounded like it was a fairly non-confrontational environment. It was. Um, and did your relationship with the police and the authorities kind of maintain during the time of the occupation? It definitely did. In fact, uh, you know, one of the kind of oddball things was that first meeting that we had was is referenced in FBI files um, because Homeland Security was there. And I spoke with the police chief very recently about that, and his response was, uh, I'll vouch for you guys anytime. I can't believe you're on that list of all the crazy things. <laughs> <laughs> and he was on our show. You yeah. know, he was actually on one of our first shows, or maybe it was our first show or our second show. Second, I think. Yeah. And, you know, that was kind of like the, the way it went in town is, you know, we presented a different view of who occupiers were, which is really who occupiers are. They're representative of the the – the average people, you know, they're representative of pretty much everybody, and it's it's not what was being put forward as, you know. And that comes back to the way the the media was manipulating messages and images. Um, what is the guiding mission of Air Occupy? I think I think education. I think um, information. Um, there's a lot of stories that don't get out. There are a lot of stories that aren't told. Uh, there's a lot of information out there that nobody ever hears about. And um, we, we did a show actually called Under Underreported News. But I, I kind of think that that's a lot of our shows. Mm -hmm. um, Underreported News. I, I think for me, part of that, uh, you know, as we're speaking with the city commissioners and we're speaking with the press and we're speaking with uh, the county council and the um, police chief and police officers, 
and there's this, and the local radio guy, and there's this, you know, oh, you guys have a point in what you're saying, you know, and I think that was one of the things that I really thought was important, and Liz and Jerry think are important, is that the news just isn't getting out there. You know, that's that's really our our role, as I see it, is to get the news out there, to be part of getting the news and broadcasting and working with other alternative media to get out all the news that's just not being covered in mainstream press. And um, that that's a great segue to my next little bit, but I, I wanted to touch base again with Liz, and, and Jerry is a lawyer also, correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Neither of us are practicing right now. Right, but you at least have a knowledge of the structure and the background, which had to serve you guys fairly well and was probably an asset. It's like you were your own personal NLG. Yeah, and um, at least for the show, it it, it helps because um, to have a little bit of background in, in constitutional law, um, not that I'm a scholar of constitutional law at all, neither is Jerry, but... Um, you know, to have some background about uh, cases and case law and how um, some of this works. And I've kind of noticed that sometimes our show take a legal slant <laughs> because we can explain that stuff, um, which is which is an uh, advantage. Um, neither Jerry nor I are attorneys in Florida, so we really didn't want to get into representing anybody, but we could talk, we could, we can speak about um, First Amendment rights and um, right to assembly, right to speech, free speech, and um, how, how Occupy Daytona Beach should, you know, should approach things and, and when things are illegal. Yeah, things right. Like that. It's been incredible. I mean, she's kind of downplaying it. She says they're not constitutional experts, but I'm constantly, <laughs> like, my jaw drops open. I go, how do you know that? <laughs> how? Where, where did that, it's, it's, and it's really, it makes the show, because that's, it's that, uh, my mother calls it gravitas, but it's, right. you know, that uh, inside information that is, you know, explained in an understandable way from somebody who really knows what they're talking about. I yeah. knows what we're talking about. That's the other thing about being a lawyer. <laughs> a <little> bullshit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah you, no, you can say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're broadcasting. You're busted. That's totally. <laughs> um, well, we're a free speech channel, so you know, lay into it. So I was wondering, do you guys have a sense of how many, what your listenership is for your program? That's a good no. question. <laughs> no. <laughs> we really don't have any idea See, because but, we're a low-tech No, I, I like that because I say, you know, we do these shows and all of us that, that do media, we do it because it needs to be done. And people say, well, don't you worry about the numbers and all that. I said, well, well, no. We you know we do it because it because ultimately you're trying to reach one person, right? You just don't know who that person is. So um, I, I'm I'm actually encouraged that you don't know what your listenership is. That makes no, me I... feel optimistic. <laughs> um, you know, we've gotten some good feedback though, and uh, you know, it, when we first started, I was like, oh my god, are we just talking into like? sound waves out there, nobody's listening, and then I got over it. And it does, you know, like you say, it doesn't matter um, if only one person's listening as long as they learn something. And right. that's another thing that I love about doing the show is that um, it's given me a chance. I, I'm Deep down, I'm really a nerd. <laughs> so it gives me a chance to really, like, look into things that I'm interested in into a topic and research it and read about it and then tell what I've learned, which I think is it's a perfect job for me. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I have a, I'd rather be sitting in a stack at the library, you know, reading right. stuff, reading books, which is just, which is what I did during college. <laughs> Some. I partied a lot too, but... <laughs> Really, it's kind of funny because Liz and I have very similar personalities, and my husband always called me a, a lab rat. Like, that's what my ideal world would be 
in a lab somewhere, you know, with the books and the, you know, just closeted somewhere. Right, right. Radio station has that feel that you're in a closet. Yeah, it does. I find it very comforting. Um, <laughs> we, uh, well, it appeals to me too. So I think, I mean, any of us that do this kind of, of work, because the amount of reading and research that I do, just like you guys, is enormous. And I'm a voracious reader anyway. So this just like fell right into. Now, I'll say the subject matter is much broader than I would have picked, like, on my own accord, which is good. It forces me into, you know, learning some stuff and doing it. And then I feel like whenever we can do these shows, this is this is what I have to offer the movement. You know, I mean, I'm in a remote area, and um, but I can do this, and I can I can get it out to people. So let's talk a little bit about, because this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and I'm obsessed with it lately, is the purpose and value of the various media platforms, which includes, you know, all the digital media and, and you know, mainstream or low-tech media even, um, as it relates to Occupy specifically and social justice movements in general. What's your... What's your observation on the, you know, the the purpose and effectiveness of, say, we'll start out with digital media. Um, you can say anything you want. I mean, <laughs> don't hold back. I think I think that the digital media has, at least for Occupy and, and social, ju you know, justice movements, has has really transformed it because transformed social justice movements because. Before the internet um, and digital media, you couldn't get that information. There was there was a lot of stuff going on that you had no idea, or I had no idea about it. You know, um, if you read the newspaper, you catch a glimpse of it, but it's not the same thing as um, you know. Here's an example: like we did a show not long ago about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a really insidious um, trade agreement that's going to be approved in secret without comments from the American people. It's basically like NAFTA on steroids. Well, that's kind of an issue that I don't know that I would have ever learned about without the Internet. <clears throat> Perhaps um, talk I would have learned about it, but then um, being able to come back and do the research on my own, the um, media that's reporting on it is invaluable. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, it really is what's made the Occupy movement. There's a whole new ball game out there. I mean, you look at the internet and it's just not that old. And the the, the implication of, implications of independent media and, you know, through, and live streaming and cell phones and, you know, have yet to fully register, um, though they're already trying their darndest to shut it down, which is what says it's effective. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so. I, I just, just in addition to that, um, <clears throat> social media like live stream um, has been very valuable as well because people get to see and and seeing an event and hearing an event in live in live time is is amazing. I, you know. I, I watched some of the GAs that were in, you know, New York and Tampa and um, some other places, and, and you got to be there and even participate if you wanted to, which sometimes I wrote something in the chat, sometimes not, um, which really brings a lot of people together. Right. Um, and so just to touch on live stream a little bit, can you maybe compare and contrast that you know, that live viewing experience to something like your show does, which I, is once a week, it's accumulating information around a topic and presenting it, which may or may not be in real time, you, you know, as the event could still be going on or it could have run its course or it could be on stack to happen. So the contrast between live stream stuff happening in real time relative to something like your show or even our show 
which is, you know, kind of a step away from that. I think both are necessary. Um, you know, the live stream gives an immediate view of what's going on, and then I think our show, like your show, gives a more measured uh, step back, think about it, here's the background. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that they work really well together. Um, and actually, we have um, publicized some live stream events. There was a GMO. Um, <laughs> I got a tweet from somebody uh, over the summer, and they said, um, it was actually a GMO guy at George Washington, yeah, GW University in mm -hmm. D.C., and he said, you know, watch this live stream and help us get this out because uh, people are chaining themselves to the Monsanto factory in California. It was awesome, you know, watching that and being able to watch it, and then for us to be able to follow up with a show, talk about what happened, talk about the action and the Frankencorn mobile that they made with this just genius, um, it, it, but give the background about why GMOs, why, you know, why are these people chaining themselves to the, you know, the, uh, chaining themselves to cars in front of the gate to Monsanto, so Monsanto couldn't do business that day. Right. Um, yeah, so I think it works together. Well, you have, you document it, you, you have to document it, especially now, you know, it was, it was live streamers and, and the documentation that captures students being pepper sprayed at UC Davis, that's what captured the students who were pepper sprayed in New York, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what happened with Scott Olson, the police brutality, you know, that is an unknown dynamic that's very effective. You might, the, the, unfortunately for the people who are experiencing it, it doesn't make that much difference because, uh, I don't know, maybe they just haven't registered that they're being captured on film yet, but as far as what it does for the movement, it's hugely effective. Yeah. Well, and I would, I would like to say that um, I, I've been in touch with some other Occupy media outlets, which I mentioned before. There's Occupy Radio um, and Occupy Media Podcast, and there's a... Um, the Daily Occupier, I think it's one. Aggravated Occupier is one. Anyway, I'll get, I'll get the list. I'll post it up so people can listen to any of them that they want. But we tried to fill, form kind of a coalition together uh, along with some other public access TV um, shows. And one of the things that, that, that the media people are thinking that we would like or like to do or have people, other people from the um, movement do is watch the live stream and get it out to us, the media, you know, the media, um, so that we can publicize it to get it out to everyone else. So um, we're trying to, to um, build connections between live streamers who go to events a lot that could, or people who are watching the live stream to say, hey, you know, at this time this happened, you know, you guys need to have that on your program. Um, you know, so we can get that clip to make it more like a real media organization, which I think would be awesome. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to say. It's like our our role is different. It's different than the live streaming, but but also important, which is to present the information in a way that people can hear it, that engages them, and it imparts in the information in a way that is comprehensible and interesting. Um. And how do you uh, think the interactivity, like uh, tonight we're broadcast on our show, so there's a, ch a live chat stream. How do you think that serves? That does too, because, you know, a lot of us can't get on any kind of mainstream media. Uh, it's not easy to have access to AM stations or, you know, broadcast because it's locked down by uh, the money. Right. Um, so how else are we going to get the message out? Right. Because people hear more and more and word of mouth it spreads and you use things like Twitter and Facebook and, and uh, other options to, to get it out there, then people hear and know that there's other places they can go to get information. It's different methodologies of broadcasting, you know, broadcasting, that's the, that's the thing. And I, I'm just, you know, so interested in that. And, um, a lot of the 
people that watch our channel have had to listen to me go on in the past is like I've gotten really interested in the radio because um, it's ubiquitous, you know, it's physics and anybody, but it's so regulated in the United States. And because I looked at, I wanted to do a local low power FM station here when they were releasing the licenses and there's some technical issues and all, but I was like, okay, well, what about the FM station? What, and the amount of money involved in starting up and doing stuff like that is just, it's, it's completely out of my realm of knowledge. So then you go, okay, so there's people broadcasting, you know, what's this? And you find out that the, in the U S they build some of the best radio stations in a box units in the world. And they export them all over the world because they want everybody all over the world to have a free speech platform to get their messages out. But those systems are illegal for sale in the United States because it's regulated. Yeah. What's the radio? We were talking about, um, what, what is the group? I'm trying to think. The group, there is a group that's, that's helping people set up their own low wattage. Uh, the Promethean. Prometheus Project, Thank yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that the license uh, applications for the licenses go uh, um, go up later this year. Right, I think in April. Um, oh, in April. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I went to. Uh, they did a presentation in Asheville, and you know that's kind of what the timetable was then. Um, but you know, in our area where it's real mountainous, low power FM doesn't work in the population density is off but we're we're getting off into radio nerd land which is something i can do uh, so how effective do you guys think occupy has been in utilizing media for messaging and outreach i think the one they i think they've been very effective except in reaching uh mainstream you know i i think they've they've behind the scenes succeeded in totally changing the national conversation clearly but as far as combating uh, the, the corporate propagated perception of occupiers um, and that's where I think it comes in where, where, where to have uh, a way of presenting the information that's, that's uh, verifiable and undeniable that that, um, that like that's that's the one one thing we haven't quite moved into yet like I think we're moving into it now mm -hmm. is is packaging you know packaging it uh, tightening it and having a message that we can deliver that nobody can refute and I couch it in terms of being factual not sensational yeah it, you know right way. Um, I, because I think we've missed a lot of opportunities and I always like to think of, okay, uh, and one of my concerns is like, I always use the term preaching to the choir and it, it is great for all of us to be talking amongst ourselves consistently, but I want to, I want to be able to reach some little blue hair in Kansas city. And, and, you know, I want them to see what's really out there, not the, the preconceived notion uh, that the mainstream media packages and delivers for for consumption, um, and I think that's a role that that we all play. And I, you know, I'm impatient because I'm I'm not getting any younger, and so <laughs> you know I want us to do it better. Um, so can I, can I just comment on that? Yeah, um, yeah, please. I think I think that preaching to the choir is is good though. I mean. Because I think in a way, um, one of the things a lot of uh, progressive, radical, uh, you know, anti-consumerist, uh, anti uh, environmentalist, there, there's a lot of us out there. You know, there's a lot of different groups. And um, sometimes we have trouble making connections and making coalitions. Um, and I think Occupy has done, well, for me at least, I can speak personally, um, has done a lot to um, bring me in touch with you know, an, a person who's an Occupy in Oregon or in Kalamazoo, Michigan or in L.A. or New York, um, which I think is awesome. 
you know. So I think a certain amount of preaching with the choir is good to make the network connections that we will need. We will need to really make a change when, when um, you know, <laughs> I don't know when that's going to be, but <laughs> I think it'll happen. <laughs> and I, there's, there's something I don't know exactly how this fits in here, but this is something I've been thinking about as we've been talking. You know, one of the things that we do as Air Occupy as we've been, and, and that we did as Occupy Daytona Beach, sometimes over objection of some of the members, is that we have really connected uh, in our community. We're involved, we're involved in the issues in our community, uh, and I think that's another way that Occupy in general has been affected, effective. You see it with Occupy Sandy, Rolling Jubilee, though it's uh, more national, still connects to the community. It connects to people. Um, you know, that's another way that you reach the blue-haired woman in Kansas City is if she knows somebody in Kansas City who's an occupier who uh, helped her as her house was flooding because of climate change. Right. Um, it's just getting, you know, making it matter to whoever you're talking to, I think. It, because when people, when people experience something personally, then it's a whole different ball game than if it's in the abstract. Um, how do you think the Occupy movement has been at controlling their story and their messages and and the narrative? Um, well, that's a tough one. Because <laughs> I don't know that Occupy has, has been... I, I think Occupy... Well, let me back up. Think about that. Um, some people in Occupy have done a good job of controlling the, the narrative. And then... Some people haven't, um, and, and in response to some of the, um, the bad stories that have gotten out, um, what we found when we went to, when did we go to the, um, oh, the Keystone XL, we went to the Keystone XL um, protest in Washington, D.C. on February 17th, um, the Ford on Climate rally, and we found that even though we were Occupy, we were identify, you know, we identify ourselves as Occupy. Um, pe other people in Occupy wouldn't talk to us because we were quote unquote media. Um, oh, well, let me let me make sure. I so you you were at Forward on Climate, mm -hmm. and you presented yourself as Occupy. Other occupiers, the people that would present themselves as occupy, were resistant to engage with you because you were media. Yes, it I want to qualify that. <laughs> it, it was. It depends. The Occupy Sandy group was fantastic. Right. You know, we totally connected. We talked to lots of people with Occupy Sandy, mm -hmm. and there was no issue. The, some of the uh, group that had been. And, and some of the Occupy Sandy were in Zuccotti, including one guy we had a really long interview with. But uh, some of the, there was a group of, you know, kind of more anarchists, I think. And there was, some, some would talk, some wouldn't talk, but there was not, it wasn't like warmth and camaraderie. Let's just put it that way. There was no, you know, let's link up arms and, you know, dance down the street together. But, you know, I don't know. I think part of that, too, is not just um, bad media stories, but um, the infiltration of Occupy by uh, the government, by, you know, government spying um, the people. The, I think that um, in Occupy, this is kind of off your, sorry. I'm no, no, that's fine. Going off on a tangent, but I think, I think that part of it um, is because the Occupy groups were infiltrated all across the United States. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there were, there were people who were reporting the government, so who do you trust? And so right. I think the reaction um, that a lot of, well, some people had was to not trust anyone. We were aware of trust that. Which destroys, which destroys our community. Um, so the government's, uh, you know, tactics uh, to destroy Occupy by infiltration, uh, by bad media, um, reporting that I do think that that was um, calculated. I don't know if it's government orchestrated, but there was a lot of bad press, and um, I think it worked. It's, it's kind of incredible. I mean, in talking about the bad press, is you know the thing that I found. 
I don't have a television, so maybe that's got something to do with it. But what was incredible to me is how people would talk about, you know, occupiers and violence or whatever they would say about a couple of people spray painting a building or breaking a window, you know, and not register that, you know, <laughs> students, you know, kids, you're talking journalists, uh, ordinary citizens were thrown to the street, uh, shot with rubber bullets, pepper sprayed, just for expressing their First Amendment rights. Yep. So, I mean, and that was totally because of media slants. I mean, that, that was totally the result of, of mainstream media presenting uh, a can of spray paint as if it trumped a can of pepper spray. Right. It's <laughs> <laughs> it was no. That's a good. That's a good example of how man, the media manipulated the message, and you know, in what reasonable world does spray paint, you know, trump pepper spray and the use thereof? But it's just all the way it's delivered, and it's the it's one of the challenges we have. Our our whole method of delivery and presentation um, is which which kind of is my next question. What are what are our challenges in message and story distribution and how can we as content producers address those? Well, I think our challenge is probably the primary challenge is legitimacy. You know, how do you convey uh, reason and fact and legitimacy to a, a, a structure that's created to shut you down. Um, the other thing is nonviolence, um, because that helps to establish legitimacy and 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 cement it. You have any thoughts on that, Liz? Yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're right, Shannon. Um, you know, we we have I, I see some stories um, you know I on, on my on our Twitter feed I like to post stories about Occupy and I see some stories about that have negative plants on Occupy or show Occupy or people who are in Occupy in a negative light and I purpose, purposefully do not. Um, tweet those stories out. I try to keep everything that I send about Occupy positive, um, which is perhaps not what a journalist should do, but I think that there's enough negative out there about Occupy that we need to keep it positive because there's a lot of positive going on that's not, you know, not getting out. Um, you know, groups meeting about homelessness. Um, uh, uh, there was a toy drive, I think, at one of them, you know, around Christmas, just doing things for the community under the name of Occupy. Well, Occupy Sandy is a great one. Right, I mean? right. There, there's a lot of things that Occupy are doing. So I think one of the things that we need to do as content providers is focus on the positive. Did you have anything to add, Shannon? Yes, on that, uh, one of the things, I, I went off on the, uh, uh, we were on somebody else's show like a couple weeks ago, and the guy called and I misunderstood what he said, and so I went into this tangent, but I really think it's important, which is, you know, there's this, this concerted, well-funded effort. I mean, to the point of hiring, uh, it's, what is it, Americans for Prosperity is, is, you know, actually paying people to discredit occupiers to show up as if they're counter-protesters to places where occupiers are. That's a Koch Brothers funded effort, you know. Um, so here's this concerted, well-funded effort to discredit occupiers, and I think come hell or high water, we hang on to the name Occupy, and we give it as much strength and honor and just say it loud and proud and don't allow it because anything else that we do as a movement, if we give up and, you know, let them declare us dead, you know, just because they want to so badly, they'll just do the same thing with the next iteration. Right. You know, we just press on. 
I think it helps to have a banner, um, you know, to work underneath. We've been talking a lot about we want to do a show coming up on uh, the WTO um, and IMF. Um, and I remember participating in uh, WTO protests in, you know, at, in 2000, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001, 1999? Yeah. No, 90. Was, it was 99 in Seattle? Yeah. Um, well, I went to the one in D.C. Oh, okay. Not in Seattle, but, um, you know, being involved and interested in that. But there wasn't a title for everyone. Um, not that there needs to be a title, but I think it helps unify and it helps get the message out. So um, this time around, hopefully when there are protests against the, the WTO and the IMF, um, we come as a more united force. Right. And IMF is coming up soon, right? It's, uh, I think it is. I need to check on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's could you tell us a little bit more about the people's mic project uh, from because that was that was huge I mean we had DC media group in there working and we were working all that weekend um, at board on climate but you guys hit the ground there and as I understand it got about 80 80 interviews so tell us a little bit about the people's mic project and kind of how it unfolded what your goal was and what's going on with it at the moment? Well, we, um, <laughs> that was, the Ford on Climate Rally was so much fun. Um, we went around and just talked to people, just people. Um, <laughs> we looked at, there, there was a yurt. I don't know if you saw the press yurt. Um, and since we had press credentials at that time, we had a press, we could have used them, but we didn't. Um, we thought, well, Every gotta, everybody's going to be trying to interview, you know, who, whoever is in that yurt by the stage. Um, so we thought, well, we'll just start talking to people. Um, and we had a little digital recorder that we bought and just started interviewing, asking people, you know, what their name, ba basically asking the same questions, you know, what's your name, you know, where, where are you from? And we got a lot of different answers. We got, some people were from Washington State. Um, which I think was the furthest that we, we found was Washington State. Um, Canada. Canada, yeah, depending on where they were in Canada. But, you know, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, so we asked them where they were from and, you know, what their issues were, you know, why they were there, what they were thinking while they were there. And, like you said, we got about 80 interviews. Um, just by zipping around, talking to people, and um, you know, pulling people out. If, if they had a lot of times, if they had an interesting sign, or you know, were holding a banner, or with a big united group, we wanted to talk to somebody in that group and find out, hey, what, what's your issue? You know, why are you here? Because you know, there was people. A lot of people were forward on climate. A lot of people were no against the Keystone XL, but then there were a lot of people with fracking. We met some people. I didn't even know that there was fracking in Arkansas, but apparently there's fracking in Arkansas. And there was a group from Arkansas. That was their thing. You know, they were against fracking. Um, you know, so, so the, the whole the project kind of came out of that, and um, we want to continue it. Um, we have solicited people to uh, to send in audio or video um, to us telling us uh, what they want to tell President Obama about the Keystone XL. Um, but we, we need to get the, the CD off to, to uh, President Obama. But one of the questions, let me back up, one of the questions we actually asked was, if you had five minutes with President Obama, what would you tell him about, you know, Keystone XL, about environmental issues? And we had thought, well, we should send off you, we should send them this. You know, we got such, such great, you know, a answers. We should definitely send send uh, Obama a copy of all these people from all over the United States saying different things. Um, so that's kind of what the People's Mic Project is. Um, we are, you know, we're going to send the CD, you know, um, to President Obama. I don't know if he'll listen to it. But. Right. Are those compiled and archived already for listening online? They are not, but we should do that. Yeah. The show that we did is, you know, and you can hear oh, yeah. a lot of their voices or good points that they, some of the main points 
Uh, I think there might be about 40 or 50 people that we had in the show. That I we think it's only 30, but... 30 yeah. to 30. It seemed like 40 or 50. It did. It seemed like 30. We were, up, we were up on that show. We stayed up until um, 5, 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> on that show before, before we had it up. Um, the thing that I really liked about that show, I mean, that I just thought was so cool is... I think we were the only ones who had the voices of the ordinary people who were there. Um, you know, the, and, and what was incredible was, you know, we're asking them questions and they're talking and, you know, we randomly select 80 people out of 40,000 and so many of them were personally impacted either by fracking or by climate change, their water was poisoned, their land had been claimed by <laughs> eminent domain. I mean, they were personally impacted, deeply impacted cancer. Um, it just, it just uh, environmental illnesses of other kinds. It was pretty incredible to me that so many people have been personally impacted. Right. and knew they were, like, you know. Uh, and then the other thing was we come back, and we no sooner get back, and this is where some of that other media comes in. We no sooner get back, and we find out that, you know, the reason President Obama wasn't at the White House to greet us is because he was playing golf with two oil men on their golf course with mm -hmm. the press banned from attending. You know, what? it was just pretty darned outrageous, you know, actually. Well, it's pretty indicative of what the problems are, I mean, in a nutshell. Um, I, I was discouraged that it's like, did, didn't somebody know what that calendar was? Because that was a little bit disappointing. But, you know, next time, right? That's uh, why the press was banned. Right, you know? exactly. The press was banned. Everybody thought it was because Tiger wanted privacy, like Tiger cares. You know what I mean? It wasn't about that. It was about the fact that he's playing with oil men. Right. You know, and even the media are having this argument amongst themselves about, uh, you know, like they're whining because they didn't get invited to the party, when that's where the backroom deals occurs, right there on the golf course, for heaven's sakes. I mean, what do they think that's there for? Yeah, out of sight and out of sound. Fact. I'll, I'll give a little known fact that um, at University of Virginia Business School, they actually have a class on golfing. <laughs> so that is where, yeah, you can take, you can get credit <laughs> at business school for learning how to golf. Because it's that important to... It's really true. I mean, I worked at a university, and I worked in administration, and the lobbyists of that university, the president of that university, whoever, they knew who the incoming mayor was going to be before he got elected. You know, I mean, the, all the, the heavy conversations took place on the course. I don't doubt it. So there's there's a challenge for the spring and summer. Occupy the golf courses. <laughs> That's, a good point. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. I wish we thought of it that Monday after we got back. We were just too tired. Yeah. Um. So so that was the people's might, which was a huge project. It's still underway, and you'll keep us posted that. And you do have an archive of that show, the people's might show, on your website uh, that we can. We can post in the channel and people can listen to that. Um, also want to get a little bit of info about your two-minute teach-in project because I love that because that just is like it encapsulates information. It's a quick hit. You're making a point. So tell us tell us about the two-minute teach-in project, what the purpose and the scope and the response so far has been. Um, someone, uh, so we... Um, we got put in touch with one of the founders of um, of Air America, you know, the now defunct Air America. Right. And he sent me an email and he said, hey, you know, send me a demo tape, you know, maybe we can get you on blah, blah, blah to uh, their um, no, Progressive Voices channel. Um, so, but the other thing he said was, hey, you know, if you want to do two minutes, uh, you know, we need to fill up time when for, you know, places that don't actually have commercials because sometimes Progressive Voices Channel is broadcast um, without commercials. And so we were talking about it and we said, oh, could, what if we get you one, you know, one per week, <laughs> you know, when you do that? And that's where the two-minute teaching came, in, came, came about because um, we were like, well, why don't we take what we learned in the show, boil it down to two minutes, 
um, short and sweet. These are facts. It's you know very fact fact fact. Um, and uh, get them out. And so we started doing that. They are playing right now uh, once every three hours on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn, which is um, uh, so they play once um, in uh, Bill Press and uh, Stephanie Miller. What, what are the other ones? Tom Hartman, Mike Moy, and Ed Schultz. So. Uh, once a day, they get to hear our listeners get to hear our voices telling them about Occupy, about Occupy-related topics, which is awesome. <laughs> and you know, uh, it's such a good idea. And I'm going to do something I don't normally do because I try to produce these shows a little bit cleaner. But if if you guys will bear with me, I want to play one of the two-minute segments. Can I? Do you mind if I do that? Uh, this, the, I'm going to play one, the Trans-Pacific Partnership on it, because I think this is such a good idea. I want everybody to get a sense of it. So if uh, the chatters will bear with me here, the screen's going to go all wonk, because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on doing this, but this is the beauty of live programming, right? Um, and thank you guys. I would never put the guests on hold to do something, but here we're going to play this. This is the two-minute teach-in on Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is Shannon from Air Occupy, and this is your two-minute teach-in on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Salon's Matt Stoller referred to it as the biggest trade deal you've never heard of. The 16th round of negotiations began in Singapore this week. There is no public input. Even members of Congress and the press are excluded, while Big Oil, the Big Banks, Big Tobacco, and Big Pharma, 600 corporations, hold court as official advisors to world governments during these secret dealings. Yes Magazine calls it a corporate coup, locking in corporate rule. The TPP would spark a global race to the bottom, offshoring millions of jobs to impoverished or repressive countries that allow exploitation of people for corporate profits. It would allow corporations to exploit lax environmental standards and weak regulations in other countries. Through the D TPP, corporations could dismantle our democracy and consumer labor and environmental protections. Challenging these safeguards through international tribunals that circumvent our rights and laws. Corporations could even be forced to pay high fines for negatively affecting corporate profits. A wide coalition has called for transparency, including members of Congress, Labor, Amnesty International, the ACLU, Public Citizen, and the Sierra Club. Here's what you can do. Call or visit your Congress people. Spread the word in your community. Write a letter to the editor or work to pass a local resolution. Other ideas and more on the TPP can be found on our website. Please visit us at www.airoccupy.com. See, that was that was outstanding. I love that. Do you guys have microphones muted? Oh, I did. I did. Okay. What I did was while we were listening, I thought, oh, I'll check out the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, are you still with us? Oh, she can't hear anything. Is what it says. Can you hear it, Liz? Oh, I can't hear anything. Oh, can you hear us now, Shannon? Uh, lost her. Um, let me make sure I, did, did, I didn't lose the chat. <laughs> <You're looking. laughs> Maybe, maybe I try rebooting. Hey, don't just tell her uh, don't reboot. Wait. So she can't. She has no audio and no video. Uh, she can chat. I can can't hear a thing, but I can see you. Um, tell her to. Is she muted? No. What happened? Tell her to close out of close out of the hangout and then come back in. Sorry about that. See, we were we were you know 
We were doing so good, and I had to get fancy. And I don't know how I broke Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> She said, I'll leave it for that. She thinks it's her old her old computer melting. <laughs> well, there she goes. Now, she now. So, she really like it so, much. so now. She's carrying around two computers now. It's really funny. Uh, so, well, now's your, your chance to tell a, a funny little anecdote about. <laughs> well, there's one. <laughs> she carries around two computers. <laughs> yep. And now our, now our screen's all screwed up because, so hopefully she'll come back in really quick. Um. So sorry about that, guys. This is just a technical technical glitch night, I guess. Um, why don't you? While we're waiting. It happens all the time on our show. I mean, yeah. You you said something about our equipment, and I just had to laugh because our equipment messes up all the time. And um, <laughs> so so we've interviewed Chris Hedges and Noam Chomsky. I mean, two huge interviews, you know. Like, at the beginning of the Noam Chomsky interview, I was so nervous you can actually hear my voice shaking, you know. And um, the we hung up on them, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> because, the, because the phone system doesn't work. And so people have to call into the studio. We can't call them. And then if you hit, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's so crazy. So <laughs> at the beginning of both of those interviews, you hear, you know, this dial tone, and it's like, oops. <laughs> well, that's oh, I've hung up on Noam Chomsky. <laughs> now we're waiting for Shannon to come back on. Shannon, are you there? Man, we lost Shannon right towards the end. How could that possibly have happened? Yeah. Overload. Be because it does. Well, we'll continue on with the two of us, I guess. Um, where do you think Occupy stands at the moment as an effective agent for social change? I think it has a, a really good opportunity to, well, let's, let me start, it's already produced social change because it changed the narrative, the, no, the nationwide narrative, uh, away from austerity. Um, you know, before Occupy came in, we were talking about what are we going to cut, what are we going to cut um, in the budget because we have a debt and we have deficit. And um, after October 2011, the nation said, wait a second, you know, there are bigger problems. We have unemployment, there's uh, income inequality. Now, um, I'm not sure that changing the narrative has led to actual changes as of yet. Um, but I, I think judging by that, judging by the force that, that uh, Occupy created, that it has a chance to really change some stuff. And, and like I mentioned before, um, making, yeah, getting new people in, um, it, it's really created a lot of new activists, um, which I think is very cool. I, I can tell you, we, Jerry and I, we laugh because we say that we've radicalized my mom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You should tell Jerry to stick his head in. I know he's he's stirring around and just have him. Here's the other third of of the crew. <laughs> you must have heard him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, uh, well, your eyes uh, gave you away. <laughs> oh, we did. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Here he is. He's coming. So this is Jerry, the other third of the um, Air Occupy crew, cool. coming in. How are you, man? Hey, thank you for joining us, not to put you on the spot or anything, but we wanted to make sure we got the whole team in. We we lost yeah. we lost Shannon, so you're the reserve. Technical <laughs> difficulties bring me out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you for, for jumping on. We were just getting uh, some input on uh, how effective do you think Occupy stands as an agent for social change? Well, I just, you know, I caught what Liz said. I certainly agree with that. And I do agree that there's been a whole new generation of people activated to become involved. It was uh, pretty inspiring back when the, in the days of the actual occupation to see the kids come out, the new generation of kids. I mean, we haven't had a social movement in this country for 40 years since the war, the Vietnam War. Right. And now we've been through a succession of wars, which although there was a lot of uh, street action involved in that, much of which we didn't see. Uh, I think we've had some real movement people now involved, and 
uh, you know, Occupy is in its infancy. We, what are we talking about? A couple years here? Right, less uh, than two. Year of activity and one year of seeming dormance, but there's a lot of activity under the surface now that you don't see in the parks from things like Inner Occupy and Occupy the Media. Our program would not exist if we're, we're not occupied. We're not we're not occupied to this. So it's just about movement building. I think it's a slower process than some people think. Um, it's getting people involved and getting people activated, and you got to keep at that over time. That's that's where we see our niche and what we've decided to do with our time and our sort of occupy uh, our orientation towards occupy the message of occupy the structure of occupy sort of the horizontal, we're, we find that real appealing, the non-hierarchical nature of Occupy. Right. And uh, had, had you ever uh, worked in media before the, the ladies got this question earlier? And I was I just not, interested. But I, have a, I had a kind of a deep, other than what people might recognize from back in the day, Jack, the uh, junior achievement. I worked on a television program when I was a teenager, but it's my family that has a background in, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, my dad worked in local TV forever. That was his career. And uh, he went from being a production person to being a local public affairs director. So between broadcasting and sort of social action, that's kind of what my family strains are. And I have a couple of uh, siblings who are involved in the radio business. So you I, I was aware of sort of the, the broadcast environment, but I was never involved in it in terms of producing a show. But you came from good media genes, it seems like. Indeed. So it wasn't, uh, and you guys do it, I mean, I love the way you, you guys do your show, and it's so, you know, it's fluid and it's lively. Um, and I think it's you know incredibly effective, and I, I have a lot of respect for it. So that's that's why I was very excited to be able to to get you guys on. Um, well, I should go back through my questions. Shannon, I got a text from Shannon. Yeah. She says her she thinks her computer must be too hot and it can't handle it anymore because it's um, she can't get it to work. Yeah, I have that effect on people just shutting them down. You know, so after an hour, everybody's like, okay, we're done with this, you know. <laughs> so, well, I, I hate she can't join us, but hopefully she can tune in tune in for the big finish. Um, we were talking about the two-minute teach-ins, which was, you know, we, we played one, and uh, which is when we lost Shannon for who knows what reason. But um, it was it's an extraordinary project, and I really like it. So um, do you have more of those on stack? Is that going to be an ongoing project? We do. And, uh, go ahead. We do. Hopefully we're going to do one one per week. Um, we have the, the – we were talking about technical difficulties. Our studio um, – anyway, <laughs> the radio studio, we're having problems. And we've had trouble getting in there to tape um, because we were doing them on our, our little recorder, but um, – the, one of the engineers said it didn't sound as good and we should go into the studio and actually use a real mic. So uh, we have, we're have we going to do one on uh, foreclosures because that was last week's show. Mm -hmm. And then this week, um, today's show was on the post, the post office and uh, dropping Saturday delivery. Right, right. Um, and so we're going to do one on that. So. Our thought is to do one per week on the basis of the show, and we've done two so far. Um, and third one on tap. Third one on tap. We've like written we're gonna it. To, we're going to try to can a couple of them. Yep. We felt we would be derivative of the show, since we were prepared for the show each week, condense that and use it as both a teach-in in and of itself and also a, a promotional bit for our own show. Right. That's and, a good strategy. And we want to have all the links on our website. so. It's not, we're not making up the stuff, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's all, we did the research, it's all researched, it's all um, it's, uh, cited, it's all, um, you know. It's all legitimate information that we've tried to vet through, you know, our own process of gathering news and information. Right. Putting, um, it, through, putting it through a different filter. And we always refer to it as an Occupy filter, but it's really just a rationality filter. 
Right. Um, so if if you if you don't mind, I would love to hear just really quickly how you put a show together. We know we find a guest, and but do you do you write like I did a question like an outline? I do an outline for our shows, but I would love to hear if you guys can explain some of the background of the show production. People might be interested in that just briefly. Well, we try to we try to go with if not if not. Uh, exactly current event topics. We have a long list of topics that we think don't get an airing in the, the mainstream press. And, and our theory behind our show is to be not a news program, but an information provider. Mm -hmm. To pick out a discrete topic that can be handled in an hour, to seek out the person who's with, with expertise, who knows about the topic, that, that isn't an opinion person, but rather more of a research type person. For, for example, we wanted to do something about access to higher education. So we went out and found the Education Trust's most recent report on access to affordable higher education. We got the author studied. We called her. She agreed to be on the program. We went out and did a lot of legwork in terms of research and get, making ourselves up to date on the issue. And then I think we're more freelance than a script, although sometimes we have more of a script than at other times, but mm -hmm. more kind of ad hoc than writing out a minute-by-minute -minute script. We do, we do more segmenting, segmenting of the hour than actual question writing, and then we kind of just go with the flow of the show. Yeah. A lot of times we will each um, research kind of a different area of, of the topic, so, you know, uh, on the show, on today's show, on the post office, um, I kind of looked into the more historical, you know, what's the history of the post office? Where's it been? Why is it important? You know, it's in the Constitution, um, and I found out that it's actually um, in the Articles of Confederation and, um, and uh, you know, decided on by the Second, Second Continental Congress. So, you know, I, I had that little piece of information. Um, I did more of the finance part of it, how it's been financed over time, and it's kind of accounting method and methodology and uh, why there was this supposed financial crisis relating to the Postal Service and right. how, that, how that has really been a guise for what has been the real, the real thing behind the privatization of the post office. Right. It sounds like you guys are going, like, just to listen to you, you're going with your particular strengths and interests in an area and then mashing it up and you know sh I got that from Shannon too to listen to the back and forth between it like you both come with an interest but with different skills and and all that and it just to put it together it's just a wonderful way to build a show it is and, and um, you're asking about like outlines or script and what we usually do is we have time blocks so um, when we interviewed Noam Chomsky um, we knew he had just gotten back from a trip to Gaza, so we knew that we wanted to open with that because it was recent. We wanted to find out, and it was really interesting. I mean, anyway, we won't get into Gaza, but um, it, uh, so so we did that for a little while, and then we knew we wanted to switch topics to media, and then you know have talk about media for for a little while, and leave it open so that we could follow up questions. Um, and really have more of a conversation, and then we moved into, um, well, I don't know that it actually we went moved like this, but we moved into Occupy, Occupy and, and movements in movements, general. At the the labor end. movement. And, um, and the kick connecting with other movements around the world, and, and then ended up with a discussion of him telling us that Occupy needed to be in a coalition with labor. Yeah. That's the first thing that he, or the next thing that he saw as a needed development. Yeah, well, I have mad respect for Chomsky, and I, I listen to that what that man says because he has lived a long time and he's seen a lot of things, and he is a great thinker. And I'm I'm very envious of you guys being, having been able to interview him. I would you know I would love to do that, but I'd probably just have a meltdown and just to hear his voice. <laughs> I was like I'm nervous. My voice you can hear in the very beginning. I'm like ah. we had sort of the same. You know, we we have the same reverence for him and approached it the same way. It was one of the, you know, often, we're, you know, we're kind of seat of the pants, so we're wait, so many days we're sitting at 11.15 waiting for the red light to light up on the, on the 
radio station telephone line. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is this is just like a, a an interview nerd question, right? I don't know if this is going to be of interest to to the viewers and chatters right now. But do you ever have the sense when you're interviewing somebody like Chomsky that like, oh my God, I'm talking to Norm Chomsky, or or I can't believe this person's even giving me the time of day because I'm yeah. I'm pretty much that way every show. <laughs> We had that with, I had that with a little bit with Chris Hedges, with yeah. Chomsky, uh, with some other folks, Bill Black, who I've long admired. Yeah. You're on the, you can't believe you're on the line by simply dropping the person an email and they agree to come on our sort of low budget show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to call in and. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it, take yeah. so. I'm always struck by, just like with you guys, you like the generosity of you taking your time out to speak to us on our show, just all the guests we have. And and I how many times I've said, Oh, I'm in way over my head. And these people, everybody are they're so gracious and helpful. And so I just leave with my head blown apart every night, you know, just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's been a great experience. Um, I agree. And you know, that was one of the things um that impresses me is that people are so passionate about what they're doing. You know, they know a little piece of, or they know, you know, in the case of Noam Chomsky or Chris Hedges or, you know, some of the other people, they know a lot about a lot of stuff. Um, but they're really passionate about it and they want to talk to you about it, which I just thought was so cool. You know, you mentioned the, the um, education trust. You know, she worked, this is what she did, but then she loved it. You know, you see Shannon's back. Shannon's back, but she's, hey. in, she's in stealth mode. You're in complete darkness. Back in black. Oh, you know, I had to change computers. I overheated my computer. I okay, well, I well, hang on. I'm going to change some screens. Do you have some light on in there, Shannon? Yeah, my usual lamp light. I told you I like a cave. <laughs> Man, all right. Give me, give me a chance. i got to rearrange all my screens here. It's a different computer. It's a problem. Yeah. I'm so impressed about your skill in, in getting all of us up on the screen because I checked it out, you know, on the, when, when we were listening to Jimmy teaching, I was like, I'll click over and just look, and then there are all our little heads, you know. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Oh, look, there's light. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there's the light. So, um, well, well, welcome back, and we were just telling Shannon's stories. So, and, you know, Jerry oh, came wow. on, so we were continuing. Um, what's in store for Air Occupy in the future? Well, to continue to do the weekly show uh, and always to increase the audience. We want to get a wider distribution network and we're kind of working on that and thinking about that. We're forming up as a 501c3. We've sought some foundation money. We actually got a grant. A uh, fairly modest grant for this year that paid for I don't know 26 weeks of airtime. So wow, that's great. We are in the process of finalizing our 501c3 application and creating a board structure uh, and formalizing what we've been doing. We we figured we'd give it a year, and we're approaching a year. I think we have 50 consecutive episodes that we've done. 48. 48. Almost, yeah. And it's a great, uh, great track record. For the foreseeable future, we plan to continue what we're doing. That's outstanding. Yeah, I like doing this. It's been fun. <laughs> so we're we're trying to figure out, you know, how to do it, and um, it, it takes it, it takes a lot of time, but you know, it's time. I'd rather be doing this than anything else, other than gardening. <laughs> right, right. Shannon, could you turn your sound down just a little bit? We're getting a lot of echo. Okay. There we go. Did I turn it down? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's better. Good. I didn't actually touch anything. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Is it still loud? What call to action do you guys... Oh, yeah. Woo. Yeah, turn that down some. So, is that better? Not better? We'll talk. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, we, we were getting a lot of echo from you. 
I wonder if it's because I was sitting back from the computer. Um, well, well, let's see. Uh, what call to action or advice do you have for listeners and viewers and potential content creators? Um, I, I would say uh, for, for anybody listening, get out there and do. Um, you know, if there's an action, you know, if there's a rally or a protest, go to it. Um, bodies are really important, and they do make a statement. Just being there makes a statement. Um, and to anybody who's producing content, send it to somebody. You know, um, if, if you've got stuff that, that you want out there, um, send it. Uh, get in contact <coughs> with us through Occupy Media Network um, because we'll find somebody to put it on either on TV. Uh, I know uh, Occupy Eugene Public Access TV and Occupy uh, Brooklyn Public Access TV are both looking for uh, video. Uh, we're looking for audio. So, yeah. We can hook them. We can hook them up with a year's worth of video. <laughs> Good. Right they, they want it. I'm serious. They're looking they're, they're for, looking for pre-packaged, uh, pre-produced, yeah, complete things that they can run sort of as in, intact, so they don't have to do much work on it. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I'll email you offline because I have. I think I checked today. I have 92 of our shows archived, sure. titled and edited, and the whole thing. So. Um, I'd, I'd love for them to get distributed. Shannon, what, what do you what do you got to call to action for for our folks that are watching and listening? Um, I think I would say speak up. You know, I, I would say speak up and get involved. Um, talk to people about what's going on because sitting quietly in our living rooms really isn't going to get us very far. That's true. Sitting in our living rooms quietly or noisily, you know, we, we do need to get out and, uh, and en engage face to face. One of the things I, I hope that, that all of our shows can do, like mine and yours and just everybody, is stimulate conversations and face to face engagement because I think that's where it all takes place. That's where the real stuff takes place. Yeah. So to hear, to listen to your show, and I want to encourage our viewers to do this: to listen to your show, or listen to the two-minute, you know, the two-minute teach-in, and then go and have a conversation with somebody, you know, face-to-face, -face, ideally, over the telephone or something. But talk about that and engage, because I think we have all these great media tools that that we have the most the highly developed communication tools in the history of the universe, but less real communication happening because it it can be isolating. And so I think part of our jobs as media content producers is to, to not let it be isolating, let it be stimulating, let it, you know, get people out there and having conversations and marching and meeting and, and doing stuff. So But I would uh, like to say if you can't, you know, get out there, get out there virtually, like you were saying, um interoccupy has some wonderful calls. It's interoccupy.net. Um you can find calls from, you know, organizing in the West Coast uh to uh, the National Gathering and actually I'll give a plug for National Gathering. The National Gathering um is having a launch call tomorrow. Um uh, we've been working on organizing the National Gathering in Kalamazoo since January, um, but tomorrow night, Wednesday night at 8 p.m., it's an uh, inter-occupy call, um, and anybody can join if you want to find out and see if you can contribute something or if you want to just listen. Um, I, you know, they're, they're having a launch, 8 p.m., inter-occupy. But, you know, inter-occupy has a lot of different calls, and, and watch live stream. If you see something interesting on live stream, send it out to somebody. Um, so, yeah, and, and meet your neighbor. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. If you see something or you hear something or you're watching something or you're listening to something, 
use all your platforms to communicate that embed it in you know your facebook tweet it out you know when you when you guys are having a show like the postal service today i was like oh uh, that's that's i couldn't listen to it but i tweeted it out because i that's something important and substantive so that's what we can all do it's just like working together and everybody can be a media distributor yeah so i like it I want to thank you guys for being on tonight. I know we, we ran a little late. We had a few hurdles to get over, but I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Liz and Jerry and Shannon. Um, thank you, Jerry, for dropping in and, and covering for no Shannon. Problem. And thank you, Shannon, for making the effort to come back. You know, that's awesome. I hate to leave without saying goodbye. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this was the Air Occupy team. Liz, Jerry, and Shannon, you can see them on airoccupy.com. The two-minute teach-ins are there. They have past show archives. They're on every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Goliath. What is the site again, please? Goliathradio.com. Goliathradio.com. So we'll be sure to tune in. Thank you so much for your time and energy. Y'all okay, have a good thank evening. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Bye. Night. Bye.